Hello and welcome back to another Monster Monday, a series where I draw a creature from D&D and I talk about its lore and its mythology and what it's like to fight in game as well. In these videos I like to use your suggestions that you leave me down in the comment section below. So if while you're watching this video a monster strikes you, not literally of course, if it's perched on the very edge of your brain as a creature that you'd really like to see me draw or hear the mythology and lore of, make sure to leave that down below in the comment section and I will definitely get to it eventually. But today's suggestion was actually first made almost a year ago by William Gorse. So thank you so much for your suggestion William and for the opportunity to get a chance to draw and talk about the fantastically slimy and gruesome Neothilid, a wonderful creature for any Lovecraftian inspired DM to use and I am definitely among their number. So, without any further ado, let's get started with today's video and talk about Neothilids. Neothilids, which I may accidentally call Neolithids on multiple occasions during this video, sorry about that, I've been calling them Neolithids for years before this video and I realised that the word is written very differently once I finally actually researched them for this video. I knew about their connection to mind flayers, also known as illithids, and I thought neo, neo illithids, neolithids, but I was very wrong. So if it does come up, I'll try and correct it, but you know when something's just stuck in your mind. <laughs> Ironic. Anyway, neothilids are absolutely massive, worm-like aberrations who, due to their tendency to dwell underground, their limbless silhouette, and their absolutely colossal size are often mistaken for purple worms by unfamiliar adventurers. Now seeing either should generally elicit roughly the same response, i.e. run like your lives depend on it, because they definitely do, but whereas one can try and hide from a purple worm by reducing the vibrations that you create when moving, adventurers may not be quite so lucky when being preyed on by the neothilid. Circling back to the enormity of these nightmare creatures, accounts actually vary, but most neothilids have been measured at around 120 feet in length, which makes them almost as long as Nelson's Column in London, two thirds as long as the Leaning Tower of Pisa, or, you know, nearly seven giraffes stacked on top of each other's heads, for some kind of frame of reference, but in other words, it's bloody massive. And unlike the simple purple worm, these creatures can always find you if they want to eat you. They were first introduced to D&D through a supplement known as the Elithiad, a book for second edition written by Bruce R. Cordell, or Cordell, and published in 1998, which expanded upon the existing lore and encounter options available to DMs who wanted to include a lot more slithering, squirming, brain-steely aberrations in their storytelling. As far as I can tell, these creatures weren't directly inspired by any literature or real-world counterpart in particular, aside from a general atmosphere loosely based on Lovecraftian mythos stories, just like the Elithid, and therefore can be considered an original creation of D&D. But I could always be wrong about that, so make sure to let me know down in the comments if you know differently. Alongside being mistaken for purple worms, one other misconception about neothilids made by adventurers is that these creatures are weapons of the Mind Flayer Empire, and that they are somehow trained and unleashed upon the world to harvest brain matter for an elder brain, or simply to destroy those who oppose the illithid people. But instead, they are actually quite the opposite. The creation of a neothilid is considered one of the most reprehensible crimes against nature to the illithid people, and allowing one to exist is an affront to their kind. This is completely bizarre because neothilids are potentially the true form, give or take, or organically traditional shape, let's say, that illithids perhaps should take, really, if left in their natural environment. Neothilids, you see, start their lives as illithid tadpoles. For those who've not had the chance to watch my Monster Monday on Mind Flayers, who have or who have not encountered these creatures before, illithids, otherwise known as mind flayers, are parasitic, brain-eating monsters who reproduce in an absolutely horrific practice known as ceramorphosis, where they grow tiny, perhaps thumb-sized or pinky-finger-sized, worm-like larvae, which they insert into the eyes of helpless, usually humanoid victims. Gradually, over time, this tadpole worms its way agonizingly into the host creature's brainstem, settles in and begins to transform this organism from the inside out until it becomes a mind flare itself. 
Essentially, this tadpole hijacks and mutates a host organism. Neothylids are created when this process goes horribly, horribly wrong. More horribly, I suppose. It was pretty ghastly to begin with. Illithid societies are semi-hive minds, which all serve a massive creature known as an elder brain, at its very core, whose psychic mucus brainwashes all other mind flares in the vicinity and forces them to act according to its will. The elder brains float in a vat of slime, which constantly wriggles, rather revoltingly, with hundreds of these little tadpoles which the brain produces constantly. These tadpoles fight and cannibalize one another until they grow to the size considered sufficient by other illithids to be seen as strong enough to be used in the production of a new mind flare through this seromorphosis procedure. Neothylids are the result of these tadpoles not finding a host brain to gestate in and hijack, but instead are left to their own devices wherein they grow in hunger, constantly seeking out larger and larger minds to eat, with a growing sense of urgency and primal savagery. It's rare for a tadpole to transform into a neothylid, because mind flares see them as an absolute abomination, ironically, and because a hungry neothylid has no affiliation or allegiance for its mind flare community, and will eat them just the same way that it eats absolutely anything else. As a result, mind flares will hunt down and imprison as many victims as they they can, that is, if they can resist eating their brains themselves, so that they have enough of a fresh supply of candidates for seromorphosis, just in case a tadpole looks like it's getting a little bit too large in that vat of jelly and could potentially grow into one of these massive monsters. Alternatively, illithids see it as their duty to execute any tadpoles that grow too large or become too aggressive if there isn't an appropriate host nearby to mutate into a mind flare. But even to the cold, calculating malevolence of the illithids, this is still seen as a waste of a potentially good mind flare and a perhaps lesser offence in their empire. A necessary evil, maybe. This is why mind flares will often experiment by putting tadpoles in non-humanoid hosts, resulting in things like a mind witness, if only a beholder is close by enough for seromorphosis, a brain stealer dragon, if something draconic is nearby, the quadrupedal Mos Greken, if deep gnomes happen to be the only available hosts for seromorphosis, a Tsakandi, if only lizard folk can be found, a Europhion, if only ropers can be found in time to be used in seromorphosis, and so on. None of these creatures are ideal hosts to become mind flayers, but the Illithids will try and avoid killing their tadpoles if necessary, although it's not always an option. Hey, I just wanted to take a brief moment to say a massive, massive thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon. But in particular, those of you who have chosen to support at the Silver Archfey level, and above, actually. This month, you guys are Raptor Dio, Ken Doman, or Kendoman, Ryan H, Christian Palmer Smith, or Kit, Max Schluter, Amanda and Jake Westfall, Darth Katana, Duck Quack, Peter Balf, Aldrin, Ethan Dibbe, Oliver Thorvald Mellock, Sam Hickson, Bork Boulderbender, Colby Monroe, Styrax, Sky Rush Soul, Nap in Camo, Steve Harrison, Trevor Traub, Dan Waterman, Nathan Stratton, Jonathan Foster, Tim Klima, Dominique Jolly, Brandon Kerr, Brock Harris, Yorick Beese, Benjamin Colburn, Tamaling Darkraven, Max Copeland, and AJ. Thanks to these guys, I get to make this content and you get to see this content. So thank you all so, so much for your support. If you'd like to join the community that we have over on Patreon and get unique rewards, like this nifty little shout out, copies of all of my illustrations, including the one that you're watching right now, one-on-one -on -one hangouts, and the chance to be one of my commission corners, then please make sure to look out for the Arcane Forge over on Patreon. I'll leave a link to that down below in my description box. And thank you so much for taking the time out to help me thank these people for the video that I had the pleasure to make and you are hopefully enjoying watching. Anyway, I won't take up any more of your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. Neothylids often come about as a result of successful raids on illithid cavern systems made by adventurers who don't know how Ceramorphosis works, and who either kill all illithids within, or manage to diminish their numbers so drastically that the survivors cannot keep up with their need to decimate their young before they grow into greater and more terrible monsters. Left isolated, hungry, and alone, one tadpole will assert dominance over their siblings by devouring them all, as it seeks some kind of respite for its limitless hunger. It will then grow too large for the confines of its birthing pool, 
and will swiftly expand into the mighty Neothilid and immediately slither through the Underdark in search of any nearby creatures to consume. Now, unlike the purple worm who hunts through the earth using its ability to feel vibrations, a purple worm instead is born with immense psychic sensitivity and power, and it uses the thoughts of nearby creatures to hone in on its targets. They all have an ability called Creature Sense. It says the Neothilid is aware of the presence of creatures within one mile of it that have an intelligence score of four or higher. It knows the distance and direction to each creature, as well as each creature's intelligence score, but can't sense anything about it. A creature protected by a mind blank spell or a non-detection spell or some similar magic can't be perceived in this manner. But essentially, otherwise, if anything is thinking within one mile of this creature, a Neothilid will make an absolute beeline for them. Its deadly sensory powers, coupled with its massive strength, it has a strength 27, so that's a plus 8, and its absolutely enormous health pool already make this gargantuan behemoth worthy of its spot as a challenge rating 13 creature. But... Adventurers are actually often caught off guard by its immense psychic and telekinetic powers because of its bestial intelligence of perhaps only three. This creature has 16 wisdom and uses that to cast psionic spells with a spell save difficulty of 16, allowing it, allowing it to cast Confusion, Feeble Mind and Telekinesis once per day each, or, most terrifyingly of all perhaps, the ability to levitate. Now the drawbacks of the levitate ability mean that this creature can only lift a certain amount of weight and only at very slow speeds. However, all articles that I've found have mentioned that Neothilids actually can use this ability on themselves despite their absolutely enormous size and, I would imagine, considerable weight. To levitate themselves above any obstacles and through terrain to psionically mine through the earth. It's this floating and levitating that often catches people off guard. If you're expecting an encounter with something similar to a purple worm, and then one starts floating off the ground, using this levitation ability to cling to the ceiling, something the size of a purple worm suddenly gains the ability to soundlessly float through the air, making it an incredible stealth monster, even with its incredible and intimidating size. Telekinesis is a particularly devastating spell that will allow this creature to pick up potentially massive obstacles, creatures, and so on, drop ceilings to entrap people, or simply have them float listlessly through the air without any form of cover or protection. Bearing in mind, no obstacles can hide you from this creature. It always knows where you are. But it might use Feeble Mind to stun someone or throw something particularly heavy and knock them unconscious. And then it will use its tentacle attack. The tentacle attack of this creature is particularly deadly. It's a plus 13 to hit, they have a range of 15 feet each, and will deal 3d8 plus 8 bludgeoning damage, plus a further psychic damage equal to 3d8. And if the target that they've managed to assault with this is large or smaller, it needs to succeed on a very difficult strength saving throw, or be swallowed by the Neothelid, causing their flesh to be digested. I was about to say digested slowly, but that's not even the courtesy that the Neothelid allows you. At the end of each of the Neothelid's turns, any creature engulfed by it in this way takes 10d6 acid damage every single turn. The acids and digestive juices of this creature are particularly bizarre. They're incredibly, incredibly strong. So much so that this creature can actually contract its many bizarre and alien stomach muscles so as to force some of these digestive juices out of its mouth in an acid breath attack. Just like a draconic breath weapon, once a DM uses this, they then get to roll a d6 every single turn. And on the roll of a 5 or 6, this ability recharges, the digestive juices have filled back up inside this creature and it may use this attack again. But the fact that this follows the rules of a Trigonic Breath weapon should give you some indication of how deadly it is. We're told that the Neothilid exhales acid in a 60 foot cone, causing each creature in that area to make a dexterity saving throw, taking 10d6 acid damage on a failed save, or half as much on a successful one. Now, incredibly weirdly, this acid is supposed to be in unbelievably corrosive, but apparently will not melt the brains of creatures, because apparently this creature still eats brains, like many illithid creatures. So presumably, if an entire party of adventurers were to be melted down to their base elements as a result of this breath attack, they would just be little floating brains hovering around in pools of this acid for this creature to then gobble up. 
which makes me wonder what on earth this acid could conceivably be made of, that it would melt absolutely everything, organic or inorganic, of someone, but not the brain. It makes me think that this must be some sort of magical liquid, or that perhaps the bacteria in this creature's gut are somehow sentient and exist symbiotically with the Neothilid to consume things that are not brains, so that the Neothilid can eat them instead. This acid must therefore somehow be conscious, or at least have some kind of intent behind it. Or maybe acid, or maybe brains in D&D are made of some bizarre stuff. Maybe the Neothilid is cognizant enough that it can protect the brains telekinetically or psychically somehow from its own acidic juices. However DMs choose to rule this, it might be a good idea for adventurers to harvest this strange acidic liquid for the use in some sort of surgical procedures. Perhaps macabre liches, necromancers, and colleges of surgery might look to find this chemical in order to preserve and sterilize brains when used in surgical procedures or something perhaps magical. Because if no bacteria or other organic things are getting anywhere near it, and it's preserving the brain perfectly, I can imagine there'll be plenty of applications for this stuff. Now I faced a lot of really weird challenges when it came to drawing this creature, because for a start I didn't want it to look exactly like my purple worm. There are plenty of creatures and magic items in the game that I believe were fully created with the intention of causing players to presume that they are encountering one creature or item, but it's a trick. And I think the Neothilid might be one of those examples where it's very clear that we're supposed to presume that this is a purple worm and actually it's something much worse purely from a description, but I really wanted to make this thing something different. I didn't want to just draw a purple worm a second time. I wanted to feature some interesting and perhaps brain-like or cranial elements to this, make it seem more illithid-like, and so I wanted to include some sort of like H.R. Geiger, Cthulhu-esque features to this creature, and also perhaps include little wrinkles that might remind myself of brains and grey matter. Simultaneously, I absolutely adore the artwork for this creature in Volo's Guide to Monsters, which is where it reaches us in this edition. So it was really hard to try and come up with my own interpretation without literally recreating the one in the book. If you have Volo's Guide, I'd urge you to turn to page 181 and spend some time studying this illustration. Unfortunately, Wizards of the Coast isn't actually that great at crediting its artists all the time, so I can't tell you exactly who worked so hard on this piece. We're told that at the beginning of the book, there are some 40 plus artists who have all thankfully been named and credited, but who supplied which particular piece is a bit of a mystery without Googling each one to see if they were all allowed to publish these same images on their own personal websites as well. And I don't think I'm alone in not wanting to spend all my time, or at least all the time required to do that. But thank you, whoever you are, for making this awesome piece of work. Now, I sometimes talk sympathetically about mind flayers, which is a little bit weird. They didn't ask to be created in this horrible ceramorphosis, and are given this absolutely vile hunger akin to a vampire, except for brains in order to sustain themselves. They are monstrous and horrific parasites, don't get me wrong. There's almost no redeeming them, but I think it's important to note that they are all clearly enslaved by an elder brain, which manipulates them. We know that they can free themselves from the control of an elder brain if they manage to remove its psychic mucus from themselves. But this also slowly kills them, dehydrating them, and often leads them to seek out the life of a lich, to have a second chance, again I guess, a very evil and selfish path. But I think it's interesting that they cling to the idea of corrupting others in Ceramorphosis when the option of being a Neothilid is available. I feel like if freed of the brainwashing mucus that surrounds them, Illithid tadpoles would intend to grow into Neothilids. They would perhaps make that choice rather than corrupting other humanoid creatures. We know that Neothilids can asexually reproduce and that the resulting creature is an entirely new breed of monster known as a Sugathi, which resembles a general sort of the same sort of general silhouette as a Neothilid, but with more tough, keratinized body parts, more like a centipede with a beak like face. It makes me curious about the motivations and intentions of the Elder Brains and what the Illithid people would become without them. Maybe I'll get to cover that one day. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed today's video and I hope you enjoyed learning about the Neothilid. I hope you like my interpretation and I hope if you're ever in the Underdark, you can keep your thoughts to yourself and avoid the everlasting hunger of the floating gargantuan worm that is the Neothilid. And happy monster hunting. Mm -hmm.